Okay, good morning or whatever the time is in your local time zone and welcome to this video presentation for the SMC conference. I'm Davide and together with my colleagues from the University of Milan and the Alborg University in Copenhagen, we're here to present our work that aims at looking into the history and trends of the SMC conference and community. So what we want to do here is to perform a bibliometrical study on the SMC conference proceedings in order to help us reflect on a larger scale on the status of the SMC uh, community at large. In order to be able to do that, we built a tool that allow us to analyze the SMC conference proceedings in order to look into trends. For example, the authorships, for example, the topics that are presented in uh, the contributions, the number of contributions, the geographic distribution, etc. This tool is available online uh, you have the link in the deck of slides, and so you are free, actually, you will be encouraged to have a look at uh, the data presented there. Throughout the rest of this presentation, we also are going to have some uh, video segments that will show you how the system uh, looks like. So, a bit of the history of the SMC uh, conference and before that, the entire field. Now, Saunders Music Computing uh, is an expression that has been introduced for the first time during the first half of the 90s. But it was until the beginning of 2000, in particular 2001 uh, to 2004, that the SMC became a conference and later on an entire community. Uh, the SMC conference was born as a joint initiative between uh, the National uh, Association for uh, Music Informatics, Computer Music. Uh, so far, you see here that we had uh, editions of this conference only in Europe. Maybe one day we will uh, cross the ocean and we'll reach other continents. Even if the participation to our conference, we'll see, already reached the entire planet. So SMC for us is a conference, it's a summer school, it's a community, and all in all is an entire field defined by the ACM classification. So. Our first goal was to organize in a systematic way all the proceedings. Now, the conference proceedings are already freely available. They are protected by Creative Commons license and they are uploaded on a platform called Zenodo. Now, one of the problems that we have with this platform is that it is not easily searchable and it does not contain all the data that we would like to have. Uh, so our solution to this problem was to build a custom database that is not aimed at replacing Zenodo as an archive of proceeding, but is actually paired with the Zenodo archive in order to track all the information that are not really available in Zenodo. If you ever try to perform a search in Zenodo, normally two things happen. Either you find exactly the thing that you're looking for, or the database returns the complete set of 272 something thousands papers that are stored on the platform. There is not really a good level of flexibility. So what we want to store in our database was uh, to emphasize the variation in the affiliation, for example, for authors. Their career evolves, so they move from one place to the other. So we want to have the author as a central information that is maintained in our database. We also want uh, to keep track of the affiliations, uh, the research centers. This will pose, this actually pose a number of questions, a number of problems on what is defined as the primary affiliation. So we use the conference proceedings and the Zenodo archive as the data baseline to validate the data we automatically extracted. Also, we enrich the database with data that is not available um, anywhere else. For example, try to infer the gender of the authors of uh, the papers. This, uh, in order to try to uh, have an idea of what is the gender gap in our subdiscipline. Just to have a quick look at SMC and the growth of the size of the conference and the acceptance rate. Now. We have extrapolated here this table that you can also find in a paper and with more data you can find online just to show uh, the 
total number of presentation as they grow throughout the years. Uh, at a certain point, a, with a notable exception of 2014, because that was a joint conference with ICMC, we kind of reached a plateauing situation that uh, placed us around 100 contributions per year. Uh, a bit more interesting is also to have a look at the authorship. So who are the authors of the paper at the SMC conference? So in this table, again, we summarized the evolution of the number of unique authors per conference. And again, we have the 2014 edition that is quite different in size because of uh, the fact that it's joined with the ICMC. Uh, also interesting is to track how many authors contribute to more than a single paper in every edition, so the ones that are really like the pillars of our community. Also, it's interesting to have a look at uh, the number of papers that spots a certain number of authors, and we can see that empirically these curves follow the so-called Lotka's law, where the number of authors making X contribution is 1 over x to the power of a of those making a single contribution with a that is experimentally validated to be close to 2. Also we can see here the overall, over the all editions of the SMC conference, the number of authors with a certain number of papers and we have a vast majority of contributors that contributed only one paper and then we have a smaller number of authors that are what we call recurring authors that contribute with more than one uh, paper. Uh, so if we look at the composition of uh, the research groups in our field, we can see here that each paper is authored on average by 1.4 institutions. So uh, there is collaboration between different research centers and between different universities. Uh, the number of papers with a certain number of authors per edition is mostly concentrated uh, with one, two, or three papers. It's rare to find authors with more than three papers per a single edition. Okay, uh, just to make some, uh, if you allow me to use this metaphor, high fidelity a list of top tens, we have uh, top ten recurring authors, so the one that contributed the most to in terms of the number of papers that presented to the conference. The one that established uh, what we consider a large collaboration network, so the number of unique co-authors that they work with during the time that they spent at the SMC conference, and the number of authors that uh, participate in the most conferences. Now, we have nobody that attended and presented a paper to all the conference, but we have a number of authors that approximate, that are getting close to that number. Also, we want to have a look at the number of countries that are represented by the SMC conference, and in particular, we already have 51 countries spanning over five different continents, so we basically reach everywhere in the world, and 585 unique institutions that include universities, uh, research institutions, music institutions, in particular conservatories, research centers, and private company. Even if then, that mm, on average, 90% of the contributions come from universities or university-like institutions. Okay, this slide is a bit dense. Is just to show you that we have the possibility to track the what we call connectivity graphs between authors and institutions. Now, a bit more of that you would be able to see for yourself in the interactive presentation or if you will decide to use our application. So you can basically check if there is a connection in terms of authorship between two individuals or to institutions. And again, we can see here a sort of clustering effects around some of the pillars of the community in terms of authors, authors that contributed uh, a huge number of papers and interact with many different authors. We kind of established a link with m many other different research centers or 
uh, authors as well for the research institutions that are, let's say again, at the center of our research, established collaborations, established networks with other uh, research centers. Now, after focusing on the authors, we will look at the topics presented in our conference. Because one of the mission of uh, SMC when the field was established was to uh, basically promote a certain set of topics that are the one identified in, for example, the European project Sound to Sense, Sense to Sound. And in order to be able to do that, we analyzed the titles and the abstracts of all the articles that we have. This information is available online. Again, by having a look at a single term, we cannot really make many inferences. A bit more interesting is to have a look at digrams, a uh, collection of two words, as they appear in titles and abstract. And in particular here, we can see some interesting trends. So the decrease of the synthesis, see, this is the root of our terms, and analysis over time, probably because we reached a plateau, we assume that we reached a plateau or a certain maturity in the field, uh, also paired with the increase of the term design, the active maturity from the sound to sense initiative, or the user and experience, experience intuited from the I'm taking from the human computer interaction field and in the last couple of years the rise of machine learning and increase of features extraction so to jump to the conclusion of our work here we saw that the participation widened over the years in terms of unique authors in terms of institution in terms of countries meaning that there is interest around the SMC community. Also, the female authorship increased and peaked in 2019. Well, we can say what will happen in during this year. The average number of authors per paper increased. The degree of connectivity of unique authors and institutions increased over time, meaning that we are actually building a research community that is increasing the level of collaboration between institution and project. So what can we aim for for the future. Now, uh, the acceptance rate, even if it's not the only uh, perfect metric to tell us how good or bad the conference is, is far from other comparable top-tier computer science conferences, even the one in, in the field of computer music. So what can be done? Should we try to get a more narrow focus, for example, like it happens in NIME, or Izmir, or DAFs, or we do not really care, we believe that we are going in the right direction by keeping this very broad uh, definition of what SMC is and what can contribute to SMC. Uh, by building our database, we realize that there are things that we can really do in order to improve the quality of the data. For example, we can change we propose to change the LaTeX template in order to provide a standardized way to input the authors and institutions. Keep an explicit mapping between authors that have multiple affiliation. This is quite difficult because by not having any form of structure in the LaTeX template, different authors decide to present their multiple affiliations in different ways. Uh, maybe even during the same conference, they appear in different papers with the same multiple affiliations presented in a different way. Uh, we can, for example, think about adding a structured extended information for authors, for example, by linking each and every author to an external platform, such as uh, ORCID. Uh, for example, this is, a quite, this is becoming quite a common uh, requirements for certain uh, publication. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, science. Uh, another thing that we realized is that we do not actually su um, currently support non-Latin alphabets, meaning that we force authors whose name is not written in a Latin alphabet to perform a transliteration with all the problems that come from this. For example, the non-uniqueness of a transliteration. 
So we have, over the course of the year, certain authors that decide to transliterate their name in different ways, making it very difficult to track them down. Also, in order to make the process of extraction of this information automatic, we encourage uh, the idea of submitting the original source file as well as the final document for the submission. And maybe we can start creating a, a custom set of tags, so a syntax and a semantic for authors and institution. So what we would like to see happening in the SMC community now. So the first thing that we want is to encourage everyone to have a look at the website that we built and report any uh, discrepancy in the data. We, have, we are not perfect. I'm sure there are plenty of mistakes in the current database. If we adopt a crowdsourced approach, we can easily fix that in re relatively little time. And so considering the little overhead that comes from uh, this system, uh, we would really like to see future editions of the SMC conference to adopt this uh, system and so populate the new edition of the SMC conference every year, not only on Zenodo, but also on this platform. OK, thank you very much for being here this remote year for this uh, presentation. I am available live, I think, for question. and I hope to see you next year, wherever the SMC conference would be. Thank you for listening. Hello, people of the internet, and welcome to this neon-colored extravaganza that will guide you through the worst corners of the back library. My name is Daniele Ghisi, and I will be presenting this, um, let's say, work, which I did with my colleague and friend, Andrea Agostini. Uh, forgive the tone and the graphics of the presentation, the lockdown has been hard on us, and intense photoshopping with bright colors seems as good an activity as any. Bach is a library for computer-aided composition in Max. Andrea and I started developing it around 2010, and the underlying principle was that a real-time parting could be a game-changer to handle scores as interactively as one could handle audio buffers. We think we had luck to take a couple of right decisions at the very beginning, but in retrospect we made some really poor choices and we would like to come clean today on the mistakes we think we have made and on how we have tried to solve them in the hope that someone else may benefit from our occasional shipwreck and in the hope that brighter minds than ours may come up with elegant solutions we hadn't thought of. Consider this as a sort of step one of AA. In the grand tradition of BuzzFeed posts, we'll present to you the 10 worst mistakes, 10 ways in which things have gone wrong. Of course, actual mistakes are much more than 10. I'm sure that both I and Andrea have our own personal shame lists, but this list is our intersection, the 10 worst mistakes we both agree upon. The conference article contains more ideas about, well, uh, <clears throat> perhaps not ideas, let's say details, perhaps not even details, let's say sentences. The article contains more sentences than this talk, and also it strikes a marginally more serious note. But there is a point, I think, in self-deprecating humor. Uh, we know that Bach's user base is growing large, and uh, it seems important today, as Bach turns 10, and as we go open source with it, to put a spotlight on its shortcomings, and not just on its strong points. Let's start with mistake number 10. Two editors are one too many. When we started Bach, we were both intensive users of open music, and it made sense at the time to quote-unquote borrow some of its paradigms. One of them was the opposition between metric and proportional notation. That is why in Bach we have two score editors. The first one dedicated to proportional notation, Bach.Roll, and the second one dedicated to traditional metric notation, Bach.Score. In retrospect, it would have been better to think of a single editor, combining the two behaviors. It may have led to more interesting scenarios. And if you think that I'm using the combined editor right now, well, unfortunately, it's just a picture with a run and score superpose, so sorry about that. We have done a couple of things to ease the pain. 
The most important one is probably the possibility to warp the time grid of Baghdad rule in a very general way, including the ability of matching it to the spacing of a Baghdad score. Vice versa, we have added a proportional notation display for Baghdad score, with a few small tricks to make it easier to read, but having a single object would have been more powerful. Mistake number nine, six inlets are five too many. Another thing we have quote unquote borrowed from open music is the idea of having separate inlets and outlets for each of the main musical parameters. And yet, the more I use computer-aided composition, the more this paradigm where one builds each parameter separately and then they are somehow magically combined to form a score, well, to me it feels like an old gizmo from the 40s or something. I tend to avoid it whenever I can, and, and when I see patches like these, I have an urge to scratch myself and blow the dust off. Scripting feels much more intuitive and practical in a way, and Bach somehow has evolved to account for it much more than for separate parameter handling. In any case, all the information about the score is output from the first outlet, so we could have devised a couple of helper tools to set and get separate parameters from there. Mistake number eight. Queries are slow. Max lists are fast, but they only can contain up to a few thousand elements. The issue is how to deal with 10, 100, a thousand times more elements, which is not that uncommon. Bach implements its own data structure called Lisp Like Linked List, or LLLL for short, which is used to communicate across all the library. LLLLs are lists that support nesting and have no hard limit in size or in depth. But this doesn't mean that searching through them is going to be fast. As a matter of fact, it is bound to be ON, which means linear in the number of elements, and hence uh, relatively slow for large lists. To account for this problem, we have created in the data library a set of objects to deal with SQL databases. Granted, filling a database will still require more time, but once you've done it, your queries will be sublinear. Mistake number seven, not enough numbers, and more specifically, not enough integer numbers. And this is not a back issue per se. Uh, it is very easy to have max overflow. Look at this product of primes yielding a negative number. But this is not a good thing if your representation system relies on uh, rational numbers like rational duration in music. And think about this, whenever you put two durations together, there's actually a computation involving the least common multiple of their denominators somewhere in the code. Look at how clumsy it gets when we add durations whose denominators are successive primes. And look at how Bach completely messes things up at the overflow point. It doesn't have to be like this. One of the things we miss the most from Lisp is its arbitrary precision arithmetics. The same algorithm in open music yields an ugly to see but yet very consistent result. You can just keep working with exotic fractions and then rely on some future quantization. This is not possible in Bach. If you need to work this way, Bach roll is the only way to go. I think that at some point in the future we may want to integrate an arbitrary precision arithmetic library that comes into play for large numbers only. I would love to see something like this in Max at some point. This is a test for primality of a Mersenne number. And by the way, no, that's not a working implementation. That's just an image. Sorry about that. Mistake number six. Bad pitches. We have got accustomed to the idea that in computer-aided composition a pitch is represented by its value in midi cents or in midi numbers. And don't get me wrong, I love cents and midi numbers as much as the next guy, but a pitch is a more complex entity. Just have a look at this chord and tell me if it doesn't make you wanna cry. In older versions of Bach, we handled enharmonicity in such a cumbersome way that I'm ashamed of even talking about it. But now we are relatively proud of our solution, which is a new data type called pitch, which one can express in a variety of ways. Uh, for most purposes, pitches behave like sort of numbers. You can make some arithmetics with them. Importantly, a pitch is also an interval, and an interval is also a pitch. Exactly like 100 cents represents both a very low C sharp and a semitone, 
D sharp zero represents both a very low D sharp and an interval of augmented second. This is crucial to make arithmetics with these guys. Here's an example of how things get transposed by augmented seconds or by minor thirds. And here's how you may want to generate a circle of fifths via an arithmetic series. And yes, middle C is C5, that's not up for debate. Mistake number five, escaping is hell. Look at these symbols, it contains parentheses which Bach interprets as a sublist, which is fair enough. But then we need a way to tell Bach that this was supposed to be just a symbol. We have decided to go with Bach ticks as escaping sign, so you put a Bach tick before anything and it's going to be interpreted literally as a symbol, not parsed into any other thing. We were relatively proud of the Bach tick because it was ASCII and it wasn't that much used. The way we implemented it, it only escapes the portion before the first space, which means that you don't need an ending sign for escaping, so we thought it was cool. In our defense, we would have gone with the double quotes, but in Max there's no way to use them consistently for symbols that do not contain a space within them. The real issue with Bach ticking came when we put Bach.eval into play. Bach.eval implements a scripting language for Bach. And at some point, we really wanted to use symbols as keys to retrieve values and set values. And at that point, things became very, very difficult to handle. The only way we could do that with the escaping we had was to put a lot of spaces pretty much everywhere. Uh, it was a mess. The way we solved it, at least within back.eval, is by using single quotes in a Python style, let's say. But this only works for Bachival. I find it very clean, but unfortunately it's only for Bachival, because otherwise it would have broken the compatibility of older patches, so we didn't feel at ease with that. And yet some nights when it is cold outside and I crawl into my warm bed with a chocolate chip cookie and a cup of herbal tea, I dream of this. Mistake number four, bad names. Classic mistake, always in fashion. I think our worst naming was probably back.append. Many back modules mirror for back lists what ZL modules do for standard max lists. But the issue is that backappend did what ZL join did, which is quirky. And then at some point, you want a module that does for back lists what append does for max lists and you run into trouble, you cannot use a pen any longer. It takes one minute to choose a bad name, it takes 10 years to try to let it go, and there's still not enough. We deprecated back a pen at some point, we added back join, but we had to use the awfully named back.postpend as a proxy for the append module. Mistake number three. Very much related, bad defaults. No one in the history of computer music has ever needed to iterate a list for more than one level at a time. I may be exaggerating a little bit to make a point, but back.eater and back.mapelement both operate by default at all levels of depth, which is essentially what you never need. And this obliges you always to write a max depth attribute explicitly. I think that for this one we have a plan. We will introduce two more modules back.4 and back.map that we do the same things at one level only. But the jungle of defaults is full of ramifications. There's certainly no lack of bad default choices in Bach. We chose the direction of rotation for the list wrong. We chose different depth default for different models, which makes sense, I think, individually, but it doesn't make sense in general. And we get to mistake number two, two complex abstractions. I think that a patch is worth a thousand words. Meet back.counter. Meet cage.fm. Max visual programming, but it easily leads to spaghetti coding, even for relatively simple patches. 
and this makes those patches hard to read and hard to maintain. Our tentative solution is to introduce a scripting language called Bell. And yes, it is another scripting language, but it makes sense, I think, because it's really tailored on backlists. Although I suppose that every new scripting language could make this argument to some extent. But honestly, from my own experience, I've been really using it more and more because it helps streamlining complex patches and it reduces the complexity in one point. And it makes it also more maintainable. Sometimes you really can do in a couple of lines of code uh, what you may need a complex patch to accomplish. We have already started to modify some of our own abstractions to account for it. And speaking of coding, let's get to mistake number one. Drum roll, please. Bad coding. Now that back is open source, you can go and have a look for yourself. The code is awful. Okay, mostly awful. There are perhaps portion of it of which we are relatively proud, but they are drowning in a froth of dusty layers. The thing is, we learn how to code properly. Well, we try to learn how to code properly while writing Bach. And the older the code is, the higher the chances that it contains weird naming conventions, unnecessarily long loops, and so on. Plus, we started using the C Max API, and we honestly wished we had used more C++ at the beginning, because it would have made life easier for many purposes. And yet, in spite of everything I've said, we love Bach no matter what, and if everything goes well, we shall spend the next 10 years trying again, failing again, and, and we promise, promise our Cahiers de Doléances will be much, be much longer, longer in 2030. Peace and love. This paper discusses recent uses of Bach Automated Composers Helper, a Max library for algorithmic composition. As the title states, this is a user's perspective, so it is only showing one particular aspect of what you can do with Bach. To situate the domain, it best falls under the category of technology for notation and representation, tenor, like the conference of the same name. And of course Bach more specifically, due to its strong Lisp influence, situates itself within the tradition of CAC, Computer Aided Composition, as a potential successor to softwares like Patchwork, Open Music and PWGL. I will divide my talk in two parts. The first part deals with the new Bach.eval object, Bach Evaluation Language for LLLL, followed by a few examples of code and their application on choral music. I will then present the current state of my ongoing artistic research in the instrumental domain, linking with Quentin in particular. So the first point in this presentation consists in discussing the Max paradigm for computer-aided composition when dealing with symbolic notation. I highly recommend to read the author's articles relating to the topic, but I will exemplify in my own practice some of the problems addressed in those papers, as I believe it exemplifies what's explained on a more theoretical level. To do so, we need to recall that in Bach, the data structure called LLLL consists of nested lists in a manner inspired by traditional computer-aided composition softwares. These lists can be represented as tree. Each time you go further down the tree, you add a level of parentheses. At the bottom right of the tree, so with already four levels of parentheses, you can see the slot content, which is what composers interested in the playback possibilities of Bach often find of interest. In our view, slots give Bach great advantages over softwares like Patchwork, Open Music, or PWGL, in which most of the formalization processes were concerned with the organization of pitch and rhythm. Indeed, the slot mechanism in Bach allows to store within each node a large amount of metadata, 
which can then be mapped to anything in order to retrieve, for instance, automation curves during playback. Here you have an example of a vocal synth, but slots are very versatile and will later show a very different approach with instruments. So, as we saw in Bach, one way of composing may consist in adding add chord messages with onset, pitch, duration, velocity, and with all the necessary information stored as slot content. For instance, with voices, those can be phonemes, text, dynamics, and for instruments, the path of which sample to play, which note head to display on the score, etc. This is a situation where the real-time data flow max paradigm makes things a bit complicated when we need to add parentheses one by one. This new way of formatting messages makes it a lot easier to build this composer UI, which generates microtonal polyphony. If we look back at the 16th century polyphony, more than harmony register or any other means, contrasts were mainly achieved through alternations between homorhythmic and imitative passages. And this is what this patch is about. Are they singing together? Do they start together? Do they sing at the same speed, etc. This new ability to write few lines of code and manipulate variables in Bach also makes it a lot easier to automate tasks. I will now show a queuing system for part extraction, allowing for the singer to hear what comes next, turn the page at the right time, etc. The queuing system referred to in the article consists of recalling the performer with his next phrase, so that he, she feels comfortable with text as well as intonation. Let's now see how to automate that. So here all the variables are capitalized by iterating on each voice of the score and comparing each note two by two, we're trying to identify the distance between one note and the following. So onset one is the onset value for the first note. Durée 1 for duration of the first note. So final 1 equals onset 1 plus durée 1 or duration 1. So here the distance named écart 1 and displayed in yellow is small because the difference between onset 2 and final 1 is small. On the other hand, in that example, final 1 and onset 2 are further away from each other. So écart 1 is larger, however still too short to sneak in a cue for the singer. Here on the other hand there's plenty of time, so the cue needs to start as late as possible. Start minus do equals start minus n minus start equals 2 start minus n equals 46 seconds. When the pause is short, the cue needs to be provided as soon as possible. So, just after the previous singer's phrase. So here is how it's implemented in Bell, short for Bach Evaluation Language for LLLL. If we have enough time to anticipate, then we paste the cue just before the next phrase. If, on the other hand, the singer has only a short rest, we pass the cue as soon as the prev previous phrase finishes. Similar methods are applied to page turns. With animated notation in particular, one has to make sure the page turn doesn't occur in the middle of the phrase, and so on. So now to give a quick overview of what I do with it, well, we just saw the very tonal baby trompetea passage. In general, however, the harmony is more driven by spectral techniques than that. In this particular piece, sounds were synthesized in MOX, a VR interface, which, among other advantages, makes gesture to sound mapping really easy. So MOX oscillators were then recorded in order to analyze their pitch content, on the top of which I then built the polyphony.
In common ground, similarly, the polyphony is built on the top of synthesized sounds. Realized with the synthesis toolkit, brass, blow tar and the like, via percolate in max, or with a FFT filtered FM spectra, like in this example. You notice the choreography is realized in in score using the spat notation of bar slots. You've also noticed the HMDs for singers, which is something I started doing last year in the piece Mit allen Augen, publishing the results at Naim and Tenor 2019. I believe it opens doors to interesting situations in performance. Technically, all the scores are synchronized by Smartvox, whose uh, tenor 2017 remains the main reference. It is a form of NMP, Network Music Performance, synchronizing all the scores through the browser. And as stated in tenor 2018, audiovisual scores and parts synchronized over the web. It works on the web, as you can see in this demo. However, I believe it remains important for me that the performers are located in the same room. So we are on the local Wi-Fi here, rather than on the internet. For the second part of my talk, I would like to focus on instrumental writing and the linkage with the Comptambre library in particular. The starting point consists in recalling that a computer-aided composition patch yielding a score with only pitch and rhythm will be of little use, say, to a German post lachenmann composer who would like to formalize instrumental techniques. I therefore built a sort of dictionary with each playing technique and its corresponding symbolic display for each instrument. Here is an example of the sub patch generating the flute part. Again, the few lines of code written in bar.evil at the bottom help making it more synthetic. With less spaghetti-like cables and the priority issues they may generate. I've then built a machine inspired by the real-time generation of the cage.not random object with the ability to dynamically control tessitura, dynamics, density, playing techniques, etc. I have here a machine which generates instrumental music according to a list of 11 parameters scaled between 0 and 1. The first step consisted in saving some presets according to my taste in order to build a small dataset. Each of these points or presets corresponds to a type of instrumental writing tied together with a harmony. Here the ones on the top are in the high register and the ones on the left have longer duration. The goal is to interpolate between closed presets. For instance, here two points have both low dynamics and high register. So register or tessitura is constant, high, as well as dynamics, low. And here the music will go slower and slower. towards the end a harmonic shift as well as a change in instrumental writing. More notes at the flute. The MS Star library features an object called KD3, which, given a configuration of parameters, will return the closest preset in my dataset. Again, in order to interpolate between two close states. The most salient features are that the second state has lower dynamics and it is a bit slower. The harmony 
changes each time the red line crosses the orange one. This one is pretty self-explanatory, going from low to high register, forte to pianissimo, and ritardando. In those two last examples, although harmony is still very important, the gradual changes of playing techniques, texture and register seem even more directly perceivable. I hope I've shown in this presentation how Bach and its new features can be used to model composer and performer-oriented audiovisual scores, both in the vocal and instrumental domains. With the rays of AI, I would like to conclude with a question I currently address myself. Most of the results in this talk emerge from explicitly programmed procedures. So, I am now trying to give more autonomy to the system. Distance calculation with objects like da-da-dot-distance, ml.kd3 or mubu.knn gave significant results. I've shown how preset interpolation can be modeled as a gesture with mubu. Since a plethora of machine learning tools today are able to recognize gestures, I wonder for instance if mubu.xmm or wekinator could be used to create new gestures instead. Thank you for your attention. Please ask questions. Okay, so here we are, and first of all, even if uh, it's not related to this uh, to this session, let me say again thanks to okay. everybody, uh, uh, participants, uh, uh, authors, uh, keynote speaker, and musician for joining us in this uh, new effort uh, on this virtual uh, SMC. We call this uh, uh, initial this beginning session. Uh, anniversary because uh, of course it deals with uh, uh, our community in the first uh, paper and it deals with uh, uh, also the anniversary of uh, a product of a project which has uh, encountered a lot of uh, uh, success and uh, I think it is important to think back about what uh, we have done as a community and in relation to our single uh, project something that typically it is uh, many times overlooked no? while looking for for new things. So uh, I saw, by the way, that there has been a strong interaction uh, in, in the chat. This is good. This was not, uh, how can I say, uh, thought before, but I think it is an uh, emergent uh, uh, issue. So we are happy uh, of it. I will uh, well, collect some uh, uh, impression and I will propose some questions, uh, uh, let's say, emerging from what has been said in, uh, in, in the chat. So first of all, I'd like to ask uh, uh, Davide, concerning uh, the, the, the history of SMC, um, we saw that uh, there's been, uh, you made a, a strong effort in trying to uh, <clears throat> organize, to discuss the history of our community. I was just thinking uh, if we can say something about the relations 
between our community and other communities. Uh, in the sense that, of course, you have worked on uh, uh, the papers and the conferences, but I was uh, asking myself if uh, it can be it could be interesting also to think about the relation between uh, SMC as a community and uh, other communities, maybe not necessarily the one more related to us, such as uh, DFX or NIME. Maybe we spoke about uh, uh, human-computer interaction. So what is the relation between, with, between SMC and other human-computer interaction uh, uh, communities? So maybe, uh, I don't know if you can say something about this, if you think this is an interesting project concerning how to map our activity. Okay, I hope you can hear me. I don't know if... I think so, actually. At least on Skype, the, we're hearing you. <laughs> I don't know if the video will switch or just the um, sound will switch. Anyway, uh, this first question that you asked is, is very important for the community in the sense uh, of how do we place ourselves with respect to the others. Now, we mentioned uh, some of the closest communities to us, NIME, DAFs, and ISMIR. And we know from our personal experience, most of us as authors contributed to one or more than one of these communities. Uh, regarding the communities that are a bit more far from where we are right now, I still think there is a, a certain amount of overlap. Of course, there, there always is, but also a room for possible interaction. Uh, I think that one of the nicest uh, places where these kind of overlap happen in a sister community is between ISMIR and the their conference of machine learning, NIPS. Uh, they managed to start a joint project, I think it was Oriol Nieto that is working at Pandora, they managed to get first a special session within that conference that then expanded to a more regular uh, I don't know if I can call it a feature uh, in that conference. Pursuing a joint conference between uh, the SMC and other communities would be for sure, uh, I would say, interesting at least, if not very fruitful, because we're at a point in time, I personally believe in history, where the best results that we can get happen when we bridge together different uh, communities, different people that think about different things. I just now realized how Italian I am by how much I'm moving my hands. I hope this is not distracting. So I hope you followed my uh, my point here, more or less. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a second question this time for Daniele and Andrea Agostini, uh, who has uh, joined us and uh, the two, so we have the two uh, responsible for the, the, the back project. So uh, it seems to me that the Bell language share in some sense the same, uh, let's say, trend of gen, as far as I know. Uh, it means that uh, sometimes it's easier to write code than to uh, visual organize uh, uh, things. Um, I was thinking about uh, the, the idea of uh, open source. So you say the project now is open source. And you wrote also this Bell language, thinking about pure data, which is the main, in some sense, possible target in relation to, to, to Bach. Uh, as far as I know, they are strongly connected to Python from this point of view. So I was thinking if you have thought about uh, using, uh, I think you mentioned it, uh, using an existing language such as Python, which is widely used, it, maybe this could help uh, uh, the, the porting of the project to other uh, system. And also, uh, speaking about uh, open sources, um, when you open source uh, a project, you hope uh, not only to have more users, but mostly to have more developers. So I, I was curious about uh, the success in these terms, which is <laughs> relevant to create a community around uh, your project, no? Okay, who goes? I don't want to you go. go, you go. Okay, I go about Bell and then you go about uh, the community. Okay, oh, come on, so, you get the east one. <laughs> okay, but anyway, <laughs> uh, Please, yes, of course, we considered uh, the first thing we considered was uh, <laughs> basing our quest for a textual language upon an existing one. Uh, actually, the first and more 
so to speak, uh, obvious choice would have been Lisp. Uh, Python was sort of a second choice and we considered it all, of course. Uh, the real problem is that we needed to uh, work upon LLLs and LLLs are quite an idiosyncratic data structure and so it didn't really fit well with any of those pa programming paradigms. So it was either we chose an, an established language uh, and somehow we hack it and we find some convoluted ways to work with LLLs uh, from, it, from within it, or we choose to stay as close as possible as, uh, to the LLL architecture, uh, but we need a language which, of course, is not completely exotic. It's also, it's also uh, a pretty simple language, and I think that anyone who knows how to code in Python or Lisp, because the language, the Bell language, has a sort of a double... Uh, 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 it has a sort of double paradigm, both uh, imperative and functional. And uh, so whoever is familiar with either of those kinds of languages should grasp uh, Bell very, very quickly. So uh, then uh, there is a lot of um, articulation about this subject in the papers that Jonathan Bell quoted in his own uh, presentation. So I'll forward you to them if you want more uh, details about this. Daniele, open source. <laughs> oh, come on. Let me just add also that um, we have tried to make, uh, he has, because Andrea has tried to make back.eval as, as compatible as possible with uh, back.exp and then exp, which is another reason, I think, for uh, being as Maxian as possible, even if um, that means a bit farther from Python. Um, the community, yeah, I'd love the uh, the short answer is I'd love to see someone taking up uh, the project to m branch it and make a pure data version of Bach, but it's a uh, it's a huge task because uh, as as we said repeatedly, the code is not well written, and um, I'm not I I re I really hope someone will uh, contribute to to many extent because there are a lot of things that could be done, and uh, we are just two. Uh, on the other hand, uh, um, I don't know. I'm, 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 I, I wouldn't know if I'm optimistic or pessimistic because if it were me, I, I know it would be a huge task because it's a huge project with a lot of line of code, thousands and hundreds of thousands of line of code. I would feel intimidated. So I would probably start small, adding little things, and then yeah. maybe taking over a, pro a larger project. But again, uh, that's just me. I hope that someone at some point says, you know what? I will make a branch for pure pure data, and I'll I'll yeah, keep it. Yeah, I was alive. also thinking uh, about someone joining you in developing back in Max. I mean, not necessarily joining you to port it, because I know that back has been used is is the base for other projects such as Orchidea by uh, Carmine Cella. So I was uh, just thinking about the, the possible base of uh, of the developers actually. Um, uh Okay, uh, I think I have to skip. I'm sorry, Daniel. I have to no skip problem. to Jonathan uh, because of uh, scaling, so we don't start too late. And uh, Jonathan, you showed us a project, which is an a set uh, uh, of projects related to to the use uh, of uh, of Bach, which is uh, always interesting from I think the developer perspective because typically you develop something, then you have users doing different things, and in particular. If I understood uh, uh, clearly, I can say that uh, we can say that uh, it's a sort of it's a set of projects related to some sort of computer aided. One can say, of course, composition, but also notation, because these systems are used live to provide cues for uh, uh, performers. Uh, I was curious to know if you have thought, and maybe you have, and I haven't understood, uh, if you have thought about uh, creating live. The composition, it means the notation for the performance. So rather than queuing an existing score to generate live this kind of, uh, this kind of situation. Sure. Well, I get often the, this comment, of course, when you see live generated notation, the first thing you think of is uh, um, Umberto Eco's uh, Opera Piesta and uh, these kind of uh, open works that generate on the... Um, on, on the go, but uh, as you said, yeah, it's live. Um, 
maybe I think a lot of uh, computer aided uh, performance and in a sense for a singer what he likes to do is do his own thing on stage and in a sense he he or she wouldn't like to get something pop up and she hasn't prepared her breath and uh, uh, in a way I've done it a little but um, not so so much. I would be more interested in perhaps uh, having a conductor able to uh, speed up at certain passages, sort of on Tesco for a way of doing things. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So thanks. Yes, it's it's uh, a known uh, uh, divide, the one between uh, in some sense, let's say, musician and improviser. It's not the same thing. They can overlap, but sometimes. It's it's a different kind of attitude, no? So of course it's important to deal with both uh, both uh, sides. So I'm looking to the chat right now. I don't see uh, I don't see any other questions. We have a couple of minutes. I am here with uh, on Skype, and I have this uh, sort of. There's board. a delay with um, YouTube. Yeah, yeah. There is. There's a delay probably. Uh, so maybe Simone, I think we can uh, proceed uh, in uh, in our conference. I'd like to thank you all for uh, uh, being here in this unusual uh, setting, and of course to be our uh, test for the first uh, session, which is uh, uh, more complicated, of course, technical. Then we we will try to go uh, seamlessly. So thanks to all. And uh, let's see the next uh, session.